Okay, so here I'm just going to riff uh, briefly, I think, on this kind of twin notions of free will and choice combined with the notion that everything is God, everything is perfect, everything is divinely designed. And how do those two square? How is that reconcilable? How is it possible that we're operating here with free will, able to make choices? We've watched some of our choices go well, right? And everyone agrees that that was a good choice or you make a choice that didn't go well. And if you, you know, pull 100 people, they go, yeah, that wasn't a very wise choice. And yet that choice and those that ability to make choices, that ability to stand on the threshold of choice and sense that it could go either way and that we, through some determination of will, right, some application of our desire or intention are able to kind of steer the course of not just our lives but the entirety of reality, right, because it's all interconnected, that we are able to sit here and do that. I know I personally get a lot of feelings of unworthiness around that. Um, how is that possible? How could I be trusted with that? Are you seeing how I'm managing some of my choices, you know, particularly in certain areas? And then, you know, that again, laid against the broader view, which is that everything is unfolding exactly as God chooses. And that God isn't like fudging it. God isn't, um, you know, taking time off or like hung over or, um, you know, didn't get a great sleep last night or is kind of half of paying attention to that, half of paying attention to his God phone or whatever. Um, God is taking intimate, unlimited interest in everything that's occurring. God is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-loving and is choosing, is designing, is creating each of these moments in all of their particularity exactly, right, exactly as they are. And this includes these experiences we have of choice, and so I think I want to say kind of two things about that. One is the way I see this being structured is essentially that we are God, right? We as an incarnated being are God, right? You can stop the sentence there, right? period. The, the reason that it seems like we're not God is because we are not right omnipotent we are not omniscient we are not omni loving we see the shortcomings or we see the limits of our power we see the limits of our knowledge we see the limits of our love we may strive against them and again and again kind of break against the rocks of those limitations and essentially gain humility to kind of realize yeah like that's not something i can do that's not something within my current skill set for example i just realized my phone at some point while i was staring at the road it sagged down and so there you go, right? This was not a perfect uh, video rendering. <laughs> there it goes again. Um, and so, yeah, like how how does that work out? I think in my sense of things, my belief is that essentially we as God, right? God, the creator of the universe as a single thing, which we all are, is manifesting down into all these kind of sub aspects or sub parts. And that the way God does that is God essentially stitches ignorance, disbelief, and confusion into us to allow God to have the experience of really, truly believing in God's heart that this is all God is, that God is just this being, this life, this lifespan, this particular set of talents and abilities, and this particular set of limitations. And then in that model, I think what I'm seeing choice as is essentially God on high, right? This, the perspective of all-knowing, all-power, and all-loving kind of delegates or designates to the incarnated God self power to finish creation in real time in physicality, right? And so let me try to give a real example of that. So I'm driving right now. I'm driving on a road and there's a light up ahead. I cannot through an act of will cause the light to change from red to green. I cannot cause by an act of will the road to change color. Right? And we can imagine fantastic scenarios where I could go re-gear the wire box or paint stuff. But what I'm talking about is from my current seat, as things actually are, I can't do that. I can choose whether to turn the windshield wipers on, whether to turn the blinker on, whether to press the gas pedal or press the brake. So there are areas where I appear to be being given some kind of discretion to operate within. And in real time, if I'm being honest, that is the honest read of my experience, right? That I have that discretion and that I can exercise it, but again, only in those particular areas. 
And so what I'm taking that to be is essentially kind of an indication that I cannot screw up the choices that are within my ability, right? So whether I turn the blinker on, whether I don't, if we want to use extreme examples, if I rip the wheel to the side, ride it into the side of the road, cause a huge crash, that from the perspective of God, right, right, from the perspective that includes the most information, that's perfect, right? It, it could not be otherwise. I would not have the discretion to make that choice if it were not within, essentially within the model of God's perfection. In other words, how, what choice I as God make down here, turn the blinker on or not, is kind of like within the margin of error within God's perfection. I don't love that margin of error example, but that just kind of flew to mind. And so the fact that I can exercise that choice is an indication that whichever way that choice goes, whichever of the options that are available to me I choose, any one of them is perfection, otherwise I wouldn't have it. And the fact that I don't have the discretion or the ability to exercise choice in those other areas, like you know, winking and making the light change or pointing my finger and making the color of the street change, indicates that it's not perfect for me to have those abilities and so I don't. And so that was kind of the first piece I wanted to get in was kind of this idea of kind of choice being delegated creation. God basically saying, and I'm going to leave for myself the ability to create reality within these certain confines, right? The blinker behavior, the windshield wiper behavior, the gas and the brake pedal behavior, that those are essentially finishable in reality. And so choice is essentially we as God accepting and using the creative power designated to ourselves by God from the all position in the limited position and we are essentially kind of co-creating reality through our exercise of choice. So then the second thing I want to talk about is, well, where or how is our choice most wisely applied, right? What, how, okay, we have this power of choice, and we can actually sense that we have the ability not just to exercise the choices that are available to us, but to look into the future, to see the potential to expand our choice power, and to then make choices along the way to create that to happen. So for example, let's say that I want to build a boat, but in my current skill set, I don't really have a choice to do that, right? I, I could build a boat, I could put planks of wood together, I suppose, and maybe it would float, but I certainly wouldn't want to go to sea on it, right? But if I were to dedicate myself for three years, five years, nine years, whatever it takes to become a, a proficient boat builder, right? I could choose to take classes, right? Choose to buy the necessary gear, choose to dedicate my time to practicing, and then eventually that choice would be something that would be available to me, and would I could trace it back to other choices I had made in the past. So essentially what I did is I created for myself an increased kind of choice menu um, and did it through the exercise of my free will. At least that's the experience I'm having while I'm down here. And what I think is interesting about this is it's really easy to see examples of this in real life, right? This is what I think education is, training is, even you know relationships we have with people. Certain people kind of open up parts of ourselves, help us realize our talents, help us find confidence, and that then improves and increases our choice menu down the road. And maybe it also improves our ability to make wise choices, right? Loving choices in the moment when those choice points come up, when we hit those forks in the road. And the point I'm kind of building to right here is it's really easy to project those choice menus out. What if we really, though, see it as wiser to also create choice menus within? And what I mean by that is, you know, it's really easy to think about how we want to make our path in life, right? In physical reality, out in the world, where things are physical, where things are real. We can make things with our hands, we can type things with our fingers, we can paint things on a canvas. But there's a really huge well of choice potential within us. And I think if you look at a lot of the master teachers, start with the Buddha, look at Jesus too, right? You look at their message, they're not just talking about going out and making better choices in life. In fact, I think if you really look at it closely, what you see them saying is it's actually making better choices within that then opens up the potential to make better choices in life. In other words, the two work off of each other, but it's not making better choices in the outside that tends to lead to better choices within. It's actually the inverse. It's making better choices within that tends to lead to better choices without. And these choices within, what I'm picturing here, I think the master choice, if I had to try to distill it to a single thing, 
would essentially be choosing to open the heart rather than to close the heart. Choosing to let go of preconceptions and attachments to thought, attachments to identities, things like that. And essentially then to free that mental energy, free that choice energy up to be more receptive to both the inner world we're experiencing and the outer world we're experiencing. The inner world is one we're all familiar with, but we're not always familiar with sharing it or with connecting with other people on that level. The inner world is the energy we feel arising inside, the impulses and urges we feel arising inside. I think deeper and beyond that, the dreams and visions we have for ourselves, and not just the visions of how we're gonna live our life in this particular life, but really deeper notions of who and what we are, what we're about, what motivates us and drives us beyond the circumstances of our particular life, really on the level of our essence, right? You might say on the level of our soul or our spirit. And the choices we make within, it's not choices to change that or shape that. I think those qualities of ourselves are essentially something that we inherit, something we arrive with, it's our legacy. So we don't really need to make who we are inside. We need to discover who we are inside. Who are we on those deeper levels? Right? Who, what's the me that I'm going to bring with me or the I that I'm going to bring with me, the essence I'm going to bring with me, not just in this life, but in other lives, right? What goes with me when I dream? What goes with me when I die? Right? What goes with me when I'm in a state of deep hypnosis, right? Or a deep meditation, right? What is that I? What is something that is constant or consistent through that? And the more we do that, the more we explore and are conscious during those states of removed from physical reality, the more we realize that there is a continuity to us, but it's not the identity that we assume in social life in order to navigate the social world, right? It's really something deeper than that. And, and the social self we have, it's not that they're, they're distinct or, or completely unlike. The social self we have may adopt a lot of the qualities of our essence, but it is really only kind of a pale and limited reflection of that much deeper, broader, ultimately more mysterious but at a minimum more dynamic and I wanted to say powerful, but really more beautiful and unlimited. That kind of rainbow spirit, that standing wave inside of ourselves. And so circling back to kind of my original point, if we're talking about acknowledging the experience of choice and we're asking, okay, what is the wisest application of my choice? What I'm encouraging is don't just see it as being an outward thing. Don't just see it as choices you're making in life, out in physical reality, out in the world. See the main benefit, the main and wisest use of choice being inwardly directed. And that inward direction of choice, again, I think if we look at what the wisdom teachers tell us, it's about letting go of our hang-ups, our prejudices, our preconceptions, of our internal habit energy of circling around the same thoughts, going back to the same guilt trips and the same fantasies over and over, right? thinking the same thoughts, having the same imaginary conversations. And it's not that those things are bad, right? It's not that anything of those is wrong. It's that we are kind of addicted to them. And so we just keep circling it over and over. We don't broaden our horizons. We limit ourselves, right? We kind of swamp and confine and dam up our energy. Our energy is a river, right? Our energy is an ocean, not a little pond, not a little swamp, not a little dammed off region of it. Where we have our comfort and our familiarity, the water is always the same temperature. Right? I always see the same little frog and the same little lizard. Right? This is comforting to us. Right? This is something we as physical beings, as mammals, right, kind of crave because there's consistency, right? We limit variables. But that really then is based on a scarcity paradigm based on basically kind of a pessimistic version of our vision of ourselves. And we adopt that and then we say, okay, well within this limited set, knowing that I'm scared, knowing that I'm timid, knowing that I don't like branching out inside my comfort zone, how can I at least make my comfort zone the best for me? And we can see that as an act of compassion toward ourselves. We can also recognize it as an act of self-limitation, as an act of essentially confining ourselves and doubting ourselves. And so if we can begin to let go of some of those habits, recognize when we're kind of circling the same thing over and over and let it go. And appreciate that that's not an easy process. It's breaking an addiction, right? It's much like breaking an addiction to a behavior in the world or physical um, chemical in the world. We're breaking an addiction on a much deeper level within us. And so it's not necessarily gonna be easy. It's gonna be hard. We're gonna have withdrawals. We're gonna have pains. We're gonna have a lot of deterrence from our comfort energy. 
And so the exercise of choice is on the master level choosing, hey, I'm not going to keep circling the same drains inside of myself. I'm going to open up my inner world, just like I want to open up my outer world, right? Have possibilities, have excitement, have freedom, have adventure, have flow, have opportunity, right? I'm going to allow that for my inner life as well. And it begins with the choice to not just stick to my same inner routines and then do a commitment and a recognition that that is not as simple as just snapping and wanting it done. That that's a process, right? Just like breaking habits in the world is a process that requires commitment and compassion and support, I'm gonna make that commitment to myself. And notice what that does. That's empowering that part of yourself that can see possibility, can see availability in the future for a better way to be and doesn't confine itself to what it thinks it can do based on what it's seen itself do. We're allowing ourselves to dream, to have visions of a reality beyond what we've already experienced and to move ourselves toward it. That takes guts, that takes courage, that takes vision, that takes commitment, that takes adaptability along the way if things don't go the way we thought they did. Right? It takes resourcefulness. And these are all the potentials, all the qualities we wanna actually unlock in ourselves. Do you see how really, that's why I think people say the path and not the destination is what it's all about because it's actually in that path that you're giving yourself the key, you're giving yourself the power, you're giving yourself the confidence to unlock things. And so how do you do it? I think it's that combination of vision, commitment, and follow through, right? And then just recognize that that's something you can exercise within yourself, right? You don't have to see it manifesting as an outward change in your reality to begin with. Maybe one of the commitments you make in advance is, hey, I'm going to save some of my energy. I'm not going to expect so much of myself out in the physical world right now. And this will give me more resources and more focus to devote inwardly. Ultimately, of course, we want flowering and full bloom in both directions, right? And let me just say at the beginning, don't limit yourself, right? Maybe that's a scarcity bias on my part. Maybe I'm seeing it as more of a zero-sum game than it needs to be. Maybe that bloom and that commitment can be fully in both directions at once. Let that be. I think what I'm really trying to say here is recognize that you do have the experience of making choice, that the choice is not limited to the outside world, it's available within, that the master choice is ultimately, I think you're gonna find, Something like opening the heart, something like letting go of fear, right? Letting go of a limited and confined sense of self and opening yourself within to possibility, opening yourself within to a vision of a richer inner life. And that doing so is really that decision and that commitment is itself the first step in that direction. And that begins to unlock new choice potential, a new choice menu, new choice power within. And so you, as the God self, incarnated, instantiated, and limited, can begin to actually undo some of your own self-imposed limitations, right? Because all those addictions, all those things were created by God. They can seem like burdens. They can seem even like torture. And as long as we see ourselves as a victim who doesn't have the power to escape them, they will be that thing. But we also, as God, have given ourselves the power in this incarnated form to undo that. And it begins by a recognition of an option, a recognition of a choice. And what I'm telling you is you do have that choice to go within. You do have that choice to go deep within, right? Beyond even this physical body, back into your spirit self. And to begin to rewire and rechange yourself, to go from that scarcity mindset, that pessimistic mindset, that wanting to kind of curl around yourself, right? And kind of create your little habits, create your little flow charts, your little kind of uh, swamps and confined spaces and to really begin to open it up to what is initially a really scary and boundless place of opportunity. But the more you time you give yourself in that space, kind of like that boat builder, the more you practice, you learn the basics, you learn the mechanics, you learn how that world works, you realize it's an environment like any other environment is. And with exposure and with time, with the freedom to make mistakes, right, the space to make mistakes, to experiment, to try things, to reevaluate, to pivot, you give yourself that experience in the inner world, right? Things can really open up and we can escape what we see as confines beyond it, beyond our abilities. We can begin to actually tap into our fullest God potential and actually begin to create here in ways we didn't think were possible. And, you know, maybe a little practical tip is meditate, right? Wow, am I the first person to say that, the billionth person to say that? No. But maybe if you thought meditation was just kind of an escape from life, sitting on a cushion for a little while in a little, you know, lotus pose with your fingers up, and you, all you're doing there is just trying to calm your mind, 
see it instead as a way to go into your inner experience, learn that inner landscape, right? Think of that boat building metaphor. You're kind of spending time in your boat workshop. And what you're doing in meditation is not active, right? You're not sitting there necessarily consciously making choices. You're giving yourself familiarity in that inner space. You're giving yourself an environmental awareness of insight. And when you do that, you begin to give yourself the foundational skills necessary to do that more exciting, active, creative work. So maybe reframe meditation that way and go into it with an excitement and an optimism about what it's setting, not just what it's giving to you in the immediate moment, which is also important, but what it's also setting yourself up for, the, the kind of cornerstones and foundations it's laying forward, laying down um, for something to come in the future.